Coming up on Tech News Today, Windows 8 is coming soon. How soon? We'll tell you. Also, iPhone bankrupts another carrier, almost, and Boxy fights evil. All that and more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, February 8th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle your used electronic gadgets from your home or office. Don't just sell it, gazelle it. Gazelle your used gadgets today at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. Joining us today from all things D, senior editor Ina Freed is back on the show. Welcome back, Ina. Ina. Hey, Good to Ina. have you. And a pro, uh, uh, a uh, fortuitous day, day uh, to have you back, as you wrote all of the news. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I'm our, out of here then. <laughs> our first three stories are all things that you covered today on All Things D. So this is going to be a cakewalk for you. Let's start with uh, Windows 8 Consumer Preview announced uh, for February 29th. Well, at least they announced that they are going to have an invitation-only event at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona on February 29th regarding the Windows 8 consumer preview. So, Ina, how how much does this make you think we'll get a download that same day? Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a big download. I mean, people flock to the uh, developer version that was made available last fall. This is much more consumer-ready. So, people love betas. They're free. Um, you know, I think it's it's geared towards enthusiasts. That's who will download it. Um, they said it was coming in late February, and lucky for them this year, it's a leap year, so they can release it on February 29th. But now we can't celebrate the release of the Windows 8 Consumer Preview every year because we'll have to wait every four years. All right. Well, they've said they're trying to narrow the time between releases, so now they can release it next uh, um, <laughs> February 29th, and it'll be four calendar years, but only one February 29th. And- so do you, you do you think we'll actually be able to download it on the 29th, the day they announce it? I would think so. Uh, they said it would be available in late February, and they didn't leave themselves any more room, so I expect it to be actually ready that day or the next day, you know. Now, The Verge says that uh, several, several Metro-style applications uh, will be in, involved uh, in the consumer preview, according to their sources. Things like camera, messaging, mail, calendar, SkyDrive, people, photos, video, and music. Those are the ones that they, they mentioned there. And they said one source uh, revealed that Microsoft's actually working to enable SMS support for the messaging app. You know, what have you heard about what we could expect to see in the consumer preview that's different than the developer's preview that's been out up till now? Well, there's a few things. They're going to launch a test version of the Windows Store, which is going to be the main way to get applications for Windows 8. So this is very similar to an app store, um, the Mac app store, or one of the uh, Android or iPhone app stores. And that's really going to be how new style apps, which are the ones that are designed for Windows 8, come to the market. And um, so you're going to see that. You're going to see a preview of it only with free apps. So the beta won't test any paid apps, but um, so there should be a lot of apps to download, and I'm sure there'll be some that come with the preview, as, as The Verge was saying, and really, it only makes sense. I mean, otherwise, you don't have anything to play with. Um, so I'm sure they will have some built-in apps. I'll probably download this thing the day of. I know Eno will download it, you know, so she can test it. I as Sarah, you guys... I don't currently have a Windows machine to <laughs> download Windows 8 on Virtual? You could go virtual machine? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wait until you tell me it's awesome. And then I'm going to download it because then I'll be jealous. All right, fair enough. I'm going to wait for the like the ARM version to be ported to something like an Android device like so I can just play with uh, that. Now, yeah. Because I want to play now with the tablet talking. version of it more so than on the desktop because the experience of the desktops, it's going to be kind of the same as, as the other ones. Like, big tiles, that that's great for a, t- a touchpad. But, like, mm-hmm. I want to use... I want to use the actual tablet version of this thing, and I want to see if there's a desktop back there because that's been the rumor. It's going to be dropped. It'll be added. It'll be there. It won't be there. I want to see with the Consumer Preview Edition if they are keeping the desktop for ARM. Well, and that, that's the last question I have for you, Ina, uh, on this story anyway. Why Mobile World Congress? Are they, is that so they can really emphasize the tablet nature of Windows 8? 
I think they want to emphasize the mobile nature. It's more than the tablet nature. You know, it's things like you mentioned with, does it support SMS? You know, one of the other things they've worked on is uh, better mobile uh, connections for, like if you have a 3G card or something. Um, they really do want to make the point that this is a mobile operating system. Um, so I think there were two reasons. One, they wanted to emphasize that. Two, given the date that they were looking to hit of late February, all the reporters are going to be in Barcelona. So I'm very happy because I was already going to be in Barcelona. So right, that's it works really... out well for me. Um, and then the other is, you know, on this question of desktop, you know, this consumer preview is probably not going to be on ARM. It's probably going to be for uh, x86. Microsoft has said a number of times that, you know, there is no such thing as a preview version of Windows on ARM. Basically, Windows on ARM comes with new computers, and those computers don't exist yet. Uh, they haven't said for sure, but I actually wouldn't expect that uh, to change significantly. Um, so I think, you know, we're again going to be looking at Windows uh, 8 for x86, which will give you a good idea of what ARM looks like, but it won't be running on ARM. So you should expect to see the desktop. Um, it doesn't answer the question uh, that you're asking. Right? Darn. Darn. <laughs> Maybe there'll be something in the code to tip it'll be, it'll be there. I'm sure that we'll see the desktop with the x86 version and we'll see the people going with I'm sure somebody's going to try to find yeah some evidence because this is something. the story that's going to be around until Microsoft officially says one way or another yeah. because they still haven't said what's going on with that. Let's move on to uh, Microsoft's favorite partner these days, Nokia. Uh, they announced when Stephen Elop took over that they were going to be downsizing. They're going to make the work staff more efficient, and boy, are they cutting another four thousand manufacturing jobs at their manufacturing plants in Comoran, Hungary, Reynosa, Mexico, and Salo, Finland. Uh, they are going to transfer the assembly of smartphones from those plants to Asian plants uh, for efficiency and money saving because that's where a lot of smartphones are made already. And these non-Asian factories are going to focus on customization for certain markets. So if they want to customize a phone for the U.S. market, they'd probably send it to the Reynosa, Mexico factory. But they need fewer people to do that. So they're, they're getting rid of folks. You know, what's the best way to interpret this? Is this responsible Nokia holding to their line of cutting costs and getting more efficient? Or are, are they cutting deeper than they need to and we should worry? No, I mean, this is what's to be expected. So, you know, one of the things that uh, Nokia said, though they weren't as emphatic about it, but it was clear in their announcement of moving to Windows Phone is this is going to be a major transformation of the company. And I think the thing that people don't realize is they're going to have these layoffs and probably more if everything goes well. This is actually a sign of just the natural progression of the transition. Um, you know, if they don't do well with Windows Phone, we're going to see even deeper cuts. These are just the cuts that make sense as you shift from a company that made phones primarily for the European market based on its own software to a company that's making phones uh, for the U.S. market and others um, using Windows Phone, which is used by other makers, the people that make the components for this are not going to suddenly relocate their operations to where Nokia is. Nokia is going to end up coming to them. Uh, so I think this is the kind of thing you can expect. It's not the first of it. I doubt it'll be the last of it. And again, this isn't the strategy is working. It isn't working. This is just the cuts that come with moving that strategy. And of all these manufacturing jobs, I mean, they're cutting the majority of the jobs in each of these manufacturing plants. So, I mean, even if they can figure out what to do in the interim with the space, it's not even a space that they're going to need. Three quarters of them will be empty. I was thinking about well, they have found some ways of, of leasing out. So they completely closed a plant in Romania, and they announced uh, not that long ago that they'd found a buyer that wanted to do some manufacturing. Now, there they were finishing the whole plant. But, you know, they're a smart business. I wouldn't be surprised if in some of these plants they sublease or you know do what businesses do when they uh you know have more space than they need maybe it'll be a hip co-working space for all those uh hungarian startups this is a mean move by <laughs> nokia i mean when they, when they got rid of their symbian people they moved them to accenture they're like hey you three thousand people we'll just move you over we have contracts for you, you have a new job four thousand jobs gone Absolutely. Well, now, I'm teasing. now we have to say that Nokia is providing job placement services mm -hmm. and, and severance packages and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, you, you, in I some don't think cases, they guaranteed this may anybody be, a new job, but they no, did say that they would certainly help. But this may be better than being forced to go work for a company you didn't sign up for. That's true. Well, I mean, the real thing is if Nokia can actually get their profits to where they want them. I mean, this, this is – if you just keep going and, and pretend like nothing's wrong and you keep – you know, I guess be – I guess, soft when it comes to what you're doing for business, 
you could end up in a mess. So if it means you have to cut jobs and have to make hard choices and make Nokia profitable, that's what they have to do. I mean, it's there it, might be another phone maker that's taking a different strategy uh, that's in a similar boat and uh, isn't making the hard choices, and we'll see how well that works for them. I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> Research. <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> the other thing to, to point out here is this solidifies Asia as the whatever belt. Uh, we haven't ca- ca- got a catchy name for the place that makes all the smartphones, but they're essentially making all the smartphones in Asia now. And every, all the other electronics, too. I mean, you The know. rare earth belt. Just, yeah. <laughs> it's just not as catchy. Makes you think they're selling rock albums. Uh, let's move on to Sprint. Posting their earnings report, uh, wide losses, bigger losses than last quarter, bigger losses than year over year. Lost $1.3 billion for the quarter, 43 cents a share on revenue of $8.7 billion. Last year, uh, they lost $929 million, so $1.3 billion to $929 million. Uh, but the good news is they gained a lot of customers. They've continued to gain customers. 1.6 million customers gained in the fourth quarter that ended December 31st. That's $5 million gained in the year, their best subscriber growth since 2005. And both the loss and the gain in subscribers are attributed to the same cause. Sprint got the iPhone in the fourth quarter. So the cost of adding iPhone customers uh, is estimated to be about 40% higher than the cost of the average non-iPhone customer. And I'm sorry, you like my artwork there? I just have to interrupt. I, I drew <laughs> that nice circle there with my computer. That was, uh, that was deftly done. Uh, I, yeah, you're pointing, she, she was pointing out on the, uh, one of the slides from the earnings call that the iPhone in their strong device portfolio is probably the strongest. Was that a sketch masterpiece, Ina? You no. know, that was, uh, the, uh, the desktop, uh, the screenshot windows seven. And it was also four in the morning. Uh, you, you just reviewed my night when I should have been sleeping the first time I wrote Nokia when I was up and yeah. I woke up again at four and wrote sprint. Anyway. That's the best circling and you that's get. The, that's the, the only one. reliving your that's the only phone that's overrepresented. I mean, the iPhone, there's four iPhones in the slide. There's like one Galaxy S2. There's one HTC. There's no really no reason to have four iPhones up in your slide, but they did. But this is a conundrum that does not just plague Sprint, right? Uh, uh, companies get the iPhone. People want the iPhone. They sign up a bunch of subscribers. So they say, "This is great. We have more people than ever using our service, but we keep losing money." Well, 1.8 million Sprint customers bought an iPhone in the fourth quarter. 40 percent of them were new subscribers, so it definitely brought more people on, into the mm-hmm. tent. The average revenue per user increased by a record three. Point six nine three dollars and sixty nine cents per user, and sales improved by five percent to eight point seven two billion total. Uh, so this is this is all good news, but there's a cost, the subsidization cost, and that's been true for AT and T. That's been true for Verizon. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the question is, are the carriers making the right bet when they say it is worth the cost of in, obtaining the iPhone in the short run to get these customers paying a monthly data fee in the long run? Well, we've seen and I think for Sprint, there's two things. The other thing for Sprint uh, is, you know, what's the cost of not having it? And I think for the last couple of years, they've paid that cost. Um, I should also point out that a lot of the charges aren't specifically to the iPhone. That was one factor. They're also in the midst of moving from what probably wasn't a good bet on WiMAX to building an LTE network. No, that's a good point. That's the other part of their loss is attributed to that. It's it. I don't know if it's exactly 50-50, but those are the two main factors. You know, we've slowly seen the cost of phones increase. Like we've seen, you know, 199 was like the top of the line it used to be. Now 299 you can get a phone like for. Tablets are starting to push that line about 349 499 So, I mean, it could be a very slow move that, yeah, maybe we could get used to seeing unsubsidized costs because the super phones nowadays cost a ton of money. They cost like 300 bucks. That's with a contract. I think like Verizon's making that quite standard with certain phones. And when somebody does a 199 phone, it's somewhat surprising. LG did that on Verizon. Like, oh, that's impressive, but not exactly a great phone. Could we ever see uh, a situation where the carriers decline the subsidy? I mean, remember, the very first iPhone, Apple sold unsubsidized, and it sold well. And it convinced AT&T that it could afford to do a subsidy to get more people into the tent and get more people paying the smartphone fee. And the carriers all seem to be convinced, like, no, no, we know our margins are going down, but it's all going to be fine in the long run. Don't worry. Would it make more sense for them to push towards unsubsidized? Well, I mean, you do see this in lots of countries in the world where the cost of a phone, um, you know, it works either way. I mean, you can make the dollars and cents work. Um, by subsidizing the phones, you do gain care, care, uh, contract 
customers for a longer period of time. That's tough to get a contract customer when they've paid full price for their phone. So there is some predictability in that. I mean, we do have uh, unsubsidized phone in the prepaid market, and it's a significant chunk of the market. And some other time we can get into a debate of, you know, for a lot of customers, prepaid actually might save them money. Um, I think, you know, we're pretty used to this model, so I don't think it's going to change. You know, it is interesting how different the cell phone business is globally. Uh, For example, in a lot of countries like in the UK and Europe, um, the person calling a cell phone pays for that cell phone call versus the person receiving it. And it's just a completely different pattern of behavior. Yeah, we mentioned something about uh, um, you know getting text spam and how it should be illegal, and, and you know it, it is because you shouldn't have to pay for something that you didn't ask for. And people in the UK were going, "What? You don't pay to receive you don't text pay to messages? Receive What's text wrong with messages? you people? That's yeah. that's the most awkward thing I've ever heard." If so. the carriers decided to not subsidize the phones, meaning the the manufacturers of the phones weren't getting money up front, right? That's what would happen. Wouldn't certain companies decide we're not going to play ball with you anymore? Like Motorola would be like, well, I'm not giving you this phone anymore. Or, or Apple. Apple's, I mean, obviously enough of a draw that, that Apple doesn't care. They get their money either way. Yeah. So when a phone is subsidized, the manufacturer still gets all their money up front. It just means that, uh, you know, what you're paying at the Sprint store isn't enough of the cost and Sprint is paying the rest. So the manufacturers don't care. They just want, in general, they would just like to get paid. I mean, there's some preferences and so forth. Um, but uh, the, the real issue is just from a customer standpoint, you know, do you want to pay for your phone? Do you want to pay $600 for that new smartphone um, and pay a lower monthly bill? T-Mobile is actually experimenting with this. So T-Mobile will offer lower monthly prices if you uh, get your phone unsubsidized. Um, but they've made it really complicated. They have these things called yeah. value plans. They can save you money, but Man, you you gotta you gotta break out your uh, you know algebra two textbook to understand <laughs> the plans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And 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 the problem is, if one carrier decides to go unsubsidized and the others don't, all of a sudden those other carriers look like they have cheaper phones because they're advertising one ninety nine, two ninety nine for phones, and 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 the phones actually cost six hundred, seven hundred dollars. So it, it ta- it's going to be a Mexican standoff for a while to see who can you know, bend first. T-Mobile is obviously the most desperate, so they're willing to try anything. But even they are trying it in this weird convoluted way so that doesn't look like they're more expensive than other folks. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, gazelle.com, the way to get some quick money for your gadgets. Go through your closets, find those gadgets you're not using anymore. Look at that thing and say, that's money. It's money sitting there. And you may think, well, I don't want to go through all the pain and agony of finding a buyer and then communicating with them and then figuring out how to ship it to them and all that stuff. You don't have to do any of that with Gazelle. You go online, you type in the name of the gadget, you find out, uh, you answer a few questions about whether you have the cables, what condition it's in, all that sort of thing. You find out how much it's going to cost, and then you print out a shipping label, t- put it on the box. And drop it off at the at the FedEx store or the United States Post Office. I I, I did it this week. I, I I'm selling my original iPad, 64 gig Wi-Fi. Went online. They offered me two hundred dollars for it. And the best part is, now that I've dropped it off, I can track the whole process. It's going to tell me whether they've gotten whether they've received it yet. It gives me the FedEx tracking number so that I can see. Okay, left San Rafael. It's in. It went through Fairfield. Now it's in Sacramento, so it's on its way. Uh, should get there soon. And so I know when my money's coming. And they'll pay you by PayPal. They'll pay you by Amazon gift certificate. They'll pay you by cash. Uh, they send you a check. They don't send you cash in the mail. That's that's not a, never a good idea. But they uh, they'll send you a Walmart gift certificate if you want. In fact, Walmart and Amazon gift certificates you get you get a bonus. You get a five percent bonus on the amount, or they'll even donate it for charity. Plus, they'll recycle your old gadgets. You got uh, esp- uh, old uh, ink cartridges around. Throw them in the box with whatever you're selling to Gazelle, and they will recycle them for you. Check them out, Gazelle dot com. And when you do. Put in your gadget and they ask you, hey, where'd you hear about this? Make sure to say, I heard it on a podcast and that podcast is called Tech News Today. Give us a little credit for it. Gazelle.com. Don't just sell it. Gazelle it. Those gadgets aren't going to get worth more. <laughs> Go do it now. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on to Amazon adding some more shows to their streaming selection. Yeah, Amazon announced a deal to stream Viacom content on Amazon Prime. So here's what they're going to get. Content from BET, Comedy Central, MTV, and Nickelodeon. So they have a, Viacom owns all of these things, obviously. Titles include The Chappelle Show, Jersey Shore, Real World, 
Dora the Explorer, some of this stuff, you know, the kids like. And Deadliest Warrior, because, you know, you got to watch. Don't forget Mob Wives. Mob Wives. I, I had that in here for you, Sarah. Thank you, I, I know you I watching that on that. Hulu. But it's you... the only only one that you mentioned that I actually watch regularly. And uh, this brings the Prime Instant Catalog to more than 15,000 videos, but the content won't be available until the next couple of months. So you got to hang tight. Uh, and some of the titles, there's a few of them right now that are not on Netflix, but usually these deals go in pairs, and Netflix might get some of these things. I think The Real World is one of the few ones that is not on Netflix that is on uh, will be on Amazon Prime. It's announced for Amazon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. When I first heard this, I said, oh, okay, so um, Viacom is making deals with Amazon that it's not making with Netflix. But that's not even true. It's more of just Amazon saying, we're catching up, we're yeah. catching up. Netflix can't say that they have the bigger library for too much longer if we keep getting deals like this. Yeah, the question is, how close is Amazon getting? Everyone seems to be all excited to see competition come into the marketplace in the U.S., and I, and I agree. That's a, the good thing. 15,000 videos, though, that's still not even close to what Netflix has television show-wise. Right. And you can pick on Netflix's movie selection quite a bit because they, that has been spotty, and the stars going away isn't going to help that. But when you, when you look at 15,000 videos, yeah, Amazon's building. And I guess the point to make is Amazon seems to be building faster than Netflix did at a similar point. They're adding new content at a greater rate than Netflix used to. But Netflix paved the way. They had to go and start all these deals and explain what they're doing and explain the benefits. Amazon is is kind of surfing in on what Netflix and Hulu have already done. And so it would make sense that they would be striking deals a little faster. It remains to be seen if they can really overtake Netflix and if they can, before Netflix has been able to see their new strategy pay off of having original exclusive content like Lilyhammer, like House of Cards. Well, another thing, too, is if you look at Amazon and Netflix, their content libraries aren't the same. But Amazon is cheaper if you're going to pay for an entire year because you pay $80 a year, which is for Amazon Prime. And then you get all... all you do have to pay for an entire year. but All of this right. content for yeah. free. But if you break it down, you're going to end up spending more for a year using Netflix and you don't get anything for free shipping yeah. via Netflix. I mean, that's kind of a and weird thing. a lot thing. of subscribers came in because of the free shipping. I'm an Amazon Prime subscriber, not for the video service, but, you know, I order a ton of stuff. And um, it's just really convenient in that way. So Amazon's building a broader service, um, which gives them, you know, it makes them, you know, on the one hand, you're, you know, they have to deliver more services. So they're actually... You know, for someone that's taking advantage of all the things they're offering, they're certainly losing money. Um, they were losing money in some cases, even on uh, Amazon Prime when it was only shipping. Um, but, you know, they are, it is this broader offering. It's got some Kindle benefits. It's got shipping. Um, the other thing I would point out, too, when we're talking about, it's not just the content library, although that's important. It's also what devices you can watch it on. For example, I subscribe to Netflix because there's a lot of devices that I want to watch content on that Amazon Prime still doesn't support. So for me... Particularly iOS devices. You know, that's the ones I was thinking of. Yeah. You know, on the original content front, Amazon does have a bunch of, like, they have Amazon Studios, and they do offer money to script writers and money to people making movies. So whereas, you know, Netflix is going out and hiring production companies, Amazon's kind of backing their own kind of studio, which is I mean, kind of like what they do for their own publishing house. So they could have some content in the long mm. run because they have been behind this. Like I've noticed this for, you know, for directors and, and, and things. It's kind of an intriguing uh, sponsorship you can land. Moving from the devices that uh, are the stuff you can watch on the devices to the devices that play them, Boxy, uh, teaming up with the Consumer Electronics Association to stop the FCC from changing the rules with cable companies. Yeah, Boxy, we saw it at CES um, announce the live TV dongle, which is an add-on to the Boxy box that would allow you to get over-the-air broadcasts uh, via an, an antenna, the way you would get over-the-air broadcast. Um, anyway, but then would go through Boxy's interface. You have like a nice guide and software integration, but also to be able to plug in a cable straight into the Boxy dongle so that you can get uh, cable channels that are unencrypted, which um, it is it goes back all the way to a um, FCC rule in 1996 that says that cable providers have to provide a basic set of unencrypted stations so that TVs or tuners or navigation devices, Boxy, Box would be one of those, and the live dongle as well, can receive them. Now, if you have an OTA tuner, then you might say, well, why do I care about these unencrypted cable channels? Because they're kind of the same thing. And that's true. Uh, some people don't have as much um, luck with OTA signals. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of an apples and oranges thing. Cable companies want to switch to digital. They don't want analog anymore, which is also unencrypted. Um, a few years ago, 
the FCC granted Cablevision's right uh, rights to get rid of analog completely, move completely to digital, because Cablevision had a really good argument. They said, if we go all digital, we will free up signal space to provide this 100 megabit per second home internet. Uh, so the FCC said, oh, okay, well, that's probably a good trade-off. They did. Um, it worked out really well. Comcast also says, listen, for one analog transmission, we can fit up to 15 digital stations, up to three HD stations. So it just makes so much more sense for us to be able to build out um, getting rid of these analog transmissions. Now, the National Cable and Telecommunications Association says that digital boxes help remotely troubleshoot problems. So let's say you've got an issue with your cable service. If it's an analog signal, you have to have somebody from the cable company drive his truck all the way across town and come and help I you. I find and that, that a bunch of that is hard crap. for the environment. I wonder how many trucks they're rolling for the analog service. I mean, they're, they're probably rolling some, but it can't be saving them that much money. Well, no, and, and Boxy uh, put up a a blog post where they said, listen, uh, why don't you look at this this uh, nice graphical chart of how much power is being drawn from these set-top boxes anyway. I mean, that's more of your problem. If you're going to talk about hurting the environment and energy consumption, it's not because of, of uh, engineers driving trucks over to your house here and there. The NCTA also says, though, that, listen, 77% of subscribers are already using digital service, so it's not like we're going to be affecting the majority of cable subscribers. But then they also call it Netflix. They say Netflix has more subscribers than any single cable provider, like Comcast, Cablevision, Time Warner. They're saying the marketplace is very competitive. Video services are being delivered over a range of different platforms, a wide array of di different devices. So in essence... They're scared of people cord cutting. They want to make it so that... No, no, no. They've said every earnings call that the, the cord cutting is a, is a myth. Well... There is no such thing. But what they're talking about here uh -huh. is, 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 is a complete 180 from that. They want to make it so that if for whatever reason the OTA signal is not available to me... Right, I cannot, over the air, if, if anybody... Over the air, know. right. Um, I cannot plug in, and I have, I have internet through a provider. I cannot plug my cable into my TV and get these cable networks. I would have to have a set-top box, which is going to cost me some sort of reoccurring monthly fee... At least $5. When I paid for Comcast, it was more. Uh, so there's that. Now, Boxy, um, along with the Consumer Electronic Association and all Vid Tech Company Alliance, they all oppose this. Uh, Boxy says that whole environment thing is just complete BS. Um, they point out that cable companies spent $50 million last year lobbying the FCC on this. Why don't you spend $50 million making your services better? Now, of course, Boxy has a, a vested that's, interest that's in this. That's a common rhetorical device sure. when, you're, when you're not spending as much as the other guy. But yeah. Uh, all right. I mean, Boxy has just rolled out a service that makes good use of these analog stations. Here's so, of course, the, they, they don't like where this is going. I just wonder why they even care so much. Here's what I think. Uh, Boxy, I love Boxy, love Avner, love those guys. I really wouldn't worry about this. If the cable companies get rid of all of this analog uh, cable... What's going to happen is people are going to get upset at the cable company. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're going to say, that, and most of the time, this is going to be in the garage, in the spare room. It's going to be places that aren't the main place. The main place, they've got the digital cable because the companies have done a good job of saying, hey, if you want the really good cable channels, you got to get the box. So you've got the box in your living room in most cases. What's going to happen is people are going to say, gosh, you know, I, I still want to watch TV in the garage. Maybe I should buy a boxy box. That's pr promote it that way. You've got Wi-Fi in your house. You've got internet. Get the boxy box and put it in the garage, and it can get all of the internet stuff and over the air stuff mm -hmm. as well. It's a better option than that ridiculous analog cable. And maybe you start liking the boxy box, and you end up kicking cable out altogether. Well, and it's not available yet, but Boxy says, listen, our live TV solution may be able to support a DVR-like service down the road. We're looking into that. Nothing's been announced yet. But they're certainly t publicly talking about the fact that they would like to provide that as well for live TV. Oh, and, 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 and uh, Avneron points out in, in the chat room that it's not just about analog. It's QAM. And QAM does carry the digital signal. It does doesn't have all of the cable card manifested features there as well. So uh, that that is a very good point. One of the issues for Boxy was getting content. They were getting blocks before. And the thing is, if you want to sell that box, because they no longer support Boxy for PCs or Macs or any, any desktop uh, application anymore, if they want people to buy that box, they want to make sure that they have... They're not giving up anything when they buy this thing. So if you can buy the dongle and attach it and still get something like ESPN, because that's something that's on basic cable that you cannot get easily on a boxy box or online unless you have like a special ISP. And there's, it's all kinds of loops. ESPN is one of the biggest 
monsters when it comes to content. And that's one of the reasons a lot of people don't ever switch off of cable because they want to watch live sports. If you want to cut down your rate and just go to analog cable connected to this device, Boxy wants to be that device. And the thing is, they can't get ESPN and certain content providers to give them rights to watch all these things as they happen because – Let's face it, you're, you're pretty much dealing with... Yet. With, with, well, yeah, it's a big yet because yeah. ESPN, the way they work with the cable companies is just incredibly... Um, it's a strong relationship. That it's not going to yeah, be moving I had, soon. I had a chance to interview um, the head of ESPN at our uh, D-Dive into Media conference last week. And, you know, they, they, he makes... You know, John Skipper makes a very good case for why the company deserves the big money it gets. But, you know, part of it is the value they bring in terms of cable companies holding subscribers. So ESPN gets, you know, on the order of, you know, between four and five dollars per month per subscriber uh, for everyone, whether they watch sports or not, uh, which is way ahead of what any other uh, cable uh, channel gets. But part of the reason is, as you say, it's it's the piece of content that uh, you really want to watch live and that isn't available in another way. And so part of the way the company has been able to get more uh, money out of the cable companies is by sticking to that. Uh, you know, we want you to pay for it. Um, they have done some stuff with alternative platforms. They're not giving it away, uh, but there is like ESPN three on Xbox Live, and there are some uh, things. And I wouldn't be surprised to see at some point a cable or satellite alternative that doesn't use uh, cable or satellite. So, uh, or even telco like um, uh, Uverse, but but actually is delivered over the internet but is more like a cable service. Yeah, I, I think over the air works a lot better than, than people give it credit for. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work everywhere, though, and that that's the issue. The people who are like, hey, over the air just doesn't work where I live. I understand that. But give it a shot. Since the digital TV transition, over the air signals have improved mm-hmm. quite a bit. Uh, I can get a lot more signals in my house now than I could a year and a half ago. I just tested it out the other day. Uh, they're constantly making sure that they they can deliver those signals. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And the other is, you know, I I I, I can't say I disagree with the CEA and 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 Boxy and everybody else on this, but I think the cable companies are idiots if they kill off this service because it's just going to annoy their customers, and it's not going to recover all that much of the bandwidth, and they're not going to get that many people to spring for the think new boxes. Think of the environment, Tom. When when you're in a dying cool. industry. You don't raise rates and inconvenience people. If you, if you, I mean, I guess they're not worried about cord cutting, but they should be. And this, what they're what they're talking about doing is going to force people towards cord cutting. So it's a, it's a, to me, it's a dumb move on the part of the cable industry. Let's finish up with, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Sorry, before before we leave the subject of broadcast television, I I happen to have been surfing the web and multitasking. I have to bring this breaking news from Entertainment Weekly. Um, it says this is going to be the last season for House. Wow. So and then we don't have to wait the me, eight days. It'll just be over. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sign of the uh, sign of the times right there. Sign of the time. Moment for house. All right. Okay. Uh, let's finish up with uh, HP NV14 Spectre available for pre-order today. It'll be shipping on February 17th. Round the horn. Who? How excited are you, Sarah Lane? Excited well, or most excited? Um, I am. I'm. I'm actually excited to see how well it does. We saw this at CES. It was uh, showed off a digital experience, and we were kind of uh, wowed by all that Gorilla Glass. I remember one, I one, as you yeah. saying, "But why is there so much of it?" And it's sort of like, "Well, I don't know why either, but it feels good." Kind of fourteen cool. inch, thousand three hundred ninety nine dollars. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm. I'm. Uh, I, I don't know. I think, it, gigs, I think, it, I think it's a really storage. nice machine. Nine and a half hours of battery life? Yeah. If it really it does been. nine and a half battery, I mean, nine and a half hours, I would be shocked. But if it can, then I'd be interested in this. But 1400 Looks like bucks, a MacBook Pro? Well, a lot of HPs look like a MacBook Pro. And lot, actually, a lot of PCs do in that, in th- in that respect. I'm tempted by this. I'll be honest. 1400 bucks. I'm, I've, I still think that that's a weird point for all the heavy, too. That's the thing. So yeah, I, I'm why are we excited. putting Gorilla Glass on this in the first place? I, I, I saw why it at digital Why not? Experience. Actually, there is. It, it makes Other, it heavy. Yeah, other than pretty, their answer was, well, it might help your Wi-Fi reception because it's more transparent to the signal. That's true. And they kind of did, they said Maybe. it just like that. It might help your Wi-Fi. We don't know. They could have gone with carbon yeah, fiber, which would have been lighter and it would be, it, that'd be a real move. I mean, Sony did this a couple of years ago with their ultralights and everyone's like, that's too dang expensive. But they were light and they they didn't have any Wi-Fi issues. Well, what about that nifty NFC capability? Right. You can, uh, you can send a URL from your Android phone to your HP and be Yeah, I just because- have this vision of the guy in front of you in Starbucks 
trying to order his coffee. He's already talking. About <laughs> this, so now yeah. he's trying to like wave this laptop. It's not for a point of, of purchase. It's not that kind of NFC. Yeah. <laughs> Although I did, I, at first I went, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And sort of like I am in it to yourself or mm-hmm. however you would get it from one system to another. But if I've got my laptop in front of me, I'm probably not surfing something on my phone. I've had the occasion where it. I have gone. I've been out walking around. I found a URL. I come in. I'm like, oh, I want to put that there. All right, I guess I'll just it would, type it, it in. It would come up. It doesn't come up it's a nice all feature. that often, I'll, yeah. I'll be honest. Yeah. yeah, but the thing is, it doesn't transfer anything but URLs at this point because it's using yeah, HP no photos. software. That would be the great idea. I want to move my photos. I'll tap it here. No, that doesn't work yet. That that would be kind of a, a nice little killer feature if they had that and when they started. Hey, here you go. Basically, I guess I'm talking about the way the touchpad used to work where you would be able to. Or the bump app works. Yeah. Let's move on to the news views. Google is quietly offering Google ScreenWise, a Chrome extension that will let Google see all of your browsing behavior. Why would you want to do this? Well, if you sign up, you get a $5 Amazon gift card code. And for every three months that you use ScreenWise, you'll earn another $5 gift code for a maximum of $25 payout. Google told Search Engine Land that the ScreenWise project actually started earlier in the year and clarified that testers are available are able to leave the project <laughs> at any time. They can check out any time they want. But we it actually data. started several months ago, and we're all going to be getting a five dollar card. They've been watching <laughs> us for months. And you get a five dollar card. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think the only reason I would uh, say people, well, one, people do anything for a small amount of money, um, but also, you know, just the idea that well, Google's probably already watching everything we do, so might as well get why some not cash. give them permission. Yeah, they can they can see my stuff. Give me twenty five dollars. You can do it for free, actually. Not a problem. The Wall Street <laughs> Journal reports that in a November letter, I'm kidding. Apple that. asked the European Telecommunications Standards Institute to clarify how essential patents are handled. Apple claims that the lack of standards for royalties has led to high rates. I would like the owners of essential patents to have a no injunction policy. Currently, Apple is clashing with Samsung and Motorola Mobility over these essential patents, so they have an interest in making sure that everyone's clear. Path CEO Dave Morin uh, published an apology for copying users' address books to Path servers and that the company has deleted the entire collection of user-uploaded contact information. Additionally, the new version of Path for iOS is available today and will ask a user to opt in or opt out of sharing your contacts. If you change your mind after opting in, the post actually says to email service at path.com to change things. ALS Technologies are back in the news. You may remember them suing Microsoft back in 1999 over additions to browsers. That case was eventually settled out of court. This time, biologist Michael Doyle from ALS claims that his program from 1993, which allowed doctors to see and manipulate images of embryos over the web, gives him the right to claim royalties from pretty much every interactive use of the web since 1993. Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the web, testified Tuesday in the case. Apple is among the companies who seem to have settled, but Yahoo, Amazon, Google, YouTube, GoDaddy, JCPenney, Staples, and CDW are all fighting on. The jury trial over validity of the patents is expected to begin tomorrow, Thursday. A while back, there were some reports of HB touchpad shipping with Android and Whoa. HP just released that, the source code for the touchpad optimized version of Android. The files are available for download right now, although there appears to be an issue with the Wi-Fi driver. Hopefully that'll get ironed out soon. Teaser images for what appears to be an Android-powered LG Optimus View are making the rounds, and it has a 5-inch touchscreen with the bizarre 4.3 4 aspect ratio. I'm not sure why it's 4 by 3 Data Cider says it has specs, 1.5 gigahertz Qualcomm processor, gig of RAM, NFC, 8-megapixel camera, and Android 2.3. It's for those analog TV channels. Right. It's retro. Okay. Those of you who like the voice calls, speaking of retro, Vonage's new app for iOS and Android has arrived, and Vonage claims you can get high-quality audio with a minimum bandwidth of 64 kilobytes per second. Calls and texts from Vonage to Vonage users are free, but if you'd like to use the app as a traditional voice line, there are in-app purchases for that as well. Vonage claims that the rates are 30% cheaper on average than Skype. Yeah, that's right. They're going after Skype. Uh, Anonymous. I was going to make a joke about going after, but you know, I'm just going to read the story. Anonymous exposed a whole slew of email messages from Syria's Ministry of Presidential Affairs. The messages showed off information meant for the United Nations and talking points for the president's interview with Barbara Walters, among other things. 78 users had their passwords exposed as well, and as as usual, 31... 
<laughs> of them were one, two, three, four, five. The most common password. And in two the world. more were one, two, three, four, five, six. Ah. Yeah, that's impressive. That's extra secure. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, Ubisoft announced that a server transition would cause some games to be unplayable temporarily, but games like Anno 270 and, and Driver uh, San Francisco would be fine. Yeah, that's not actually what happened. If you wanted to play those two games, you were out of luck, but Ubisoft says it's aware of the situation and the game pl- a gameplay will be re-enabled by Thursday morning. So uh, if you're interested in earnings calls, I don't know why you would be. Uh, Cisco saw profits rise over 43% and Groupon reported unexpected losses. So some good news, some bad news. Let's move on to the random. Randomizer. Remember Big Dog from the uh, from the fine folks at uh, Boston Dynamics? Oh, I thought you were talking about my drinking buddy from college. No, no, no. The uh, robot <laughs> Big Dog, not the okay. that, that Big Dog. Uh, they now have the Robo Mule. The LS3 robot, funded by DARPA, carries 400 pounds on a tough 20-mile trek without any refueling for 24 hours. And, uh, yeah, you can probably try to kick it, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go anywhere near the thing. It's huge. I, it, it, it's, it reminds me more of a camel than a mule. Or well, I think the mule, because it's a pack animal, you know, it sure, carries sure. things. Yeah. I don't care what, it, what, what animal looks like. It's still creepy looking. But you don't need to feed it or worry about if it's having a bad day. Yeah, and if you're a, if you're a, a trooper uh, who has to carry 100 pounds of gear, you're going to love this. Also, if it breaks a leg, you don't have to shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, that's a plus. Yeah, you might you might anyway, though, just because you're mad. You probably could shoot it and get away with it because this thing is not going to go down. Anyway, yeah, this is, this is the video of the day, watching a big robotic mule carry heavy things. I love it. It makes my day. Let's check out what's on the calendar. Nokia Lumia 800 bundle was launching on Valentine's Day, February 14th in the U.S. for $900 to Microsoft retail stores. So this is a nice carrier independent uh, unlocked phone. Includes Nokia Play 360 wireless speaker, Purity HD stereo headset, and an in-ear Bluetooth headset. But they're not... You have to buy the bundle. You can't actually just buy the Lumia 800 on its own, at least not yet. T-Mobile's announced its Valentine's Day sale. It's actually Saturday, the previous Saturday, February 11th. T-Mobile's offering 4G smartphones and select tablets for free with a mail-in rebate for models like the Samsung Galaxy S2, HTC Maze, BlackBerry Bold 9900. Hmm, yes, might be time for the BlackBerry. And the T-Mobile Springboard. And finally, iTunes is streaming a free Paul McCartney concert on February he's still 9th. Alive. Nice. He is alive and he's kicking Tom. He's kick Paul was dead. Uh, iTunes has experimented yes. with uh, live streaming concerts in the past, uh, but this one is a little bit different because it's not actually via an iPad app. Um, it's via desktop versions of iTunes or via iTunes Live uh, via the Apple TV. Although, Number you know where nine. you won't find these songs that McCartney's singing is on streaming services. He's oh. he's pulling a cold play. If you want to stream a McCartney song, then you're going to have to do yeah. it on February 9th. I just checked RDO, and he's still up on RDO, but apparently uh, he's taking down his collections from pretty much all the big guys. He took them down from Number Spotify nine. back in 2010. But I think Mog and Rhapsody and RDO are all next. All right, let's check what's incoming before we go. Jim, the aerospace engineer in California, uh, kind of confirms the whole, like, yeah, it's difficult to delete things in the database. Uh, he did say, in his opinion, as an Oracle database engineer, he might just replace the photo with a black square. That'd be easier than a deletion. Maybe that would work. Honestly, though, he says, anybody who thinks that they have some sort of right to remove or take back the data that they upload to the ever-duplicating Internet is going to learn a hard lesson. A truly embarrassing photo will have been saved, shared, and probably search indexed by multiple sites by the time you realize what you've done undo only exists in word processing and casual games this is real life we're talking here and facebook cannot save you from yourself wise words jim yeah. it's the internet <laughs> be careful what you put out there because even if facebook figures out how to delete your photos for you no one else will you can save to desktop you can archive i mean well maybe it's they could, the internet they could implement like what google has for mail goggles where you have to like do like solve a, a math problem before you before you upload exactly anything. so then yeah. you're like well, you how drunk are you while no, you're exactly. posting that's this? a great idea although have you seen the kids math scores these days i don't think they could do it sober <laughs> <laughs> it shouldn't be a capture you can read those better drunk 
Next email from Kurt Moreno, the Kung Fu drafter. Hello, Kurt. Says, I felt compelled to write to Sarah and share something she's probably been told a million times since episode 428. She and Shannon Morse were discussing the difficulty of telling which earbud was left and which earbud was right. Uh, Because math is hard. For some number of years, the earbud industry... (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Has adopted a practice of placing tactile cues on the buds. Most of the time, it's a small raised dot on the left bud, but other times, it's a raised line or some sort of pattern. Seems that all the earbuds I see today have these cues. Maybe Apple buds don't, because I don't have an Apple product. Haven't owned one in nearly a decade. Well, let me look. You got one? You well, got I've, one right there? I've got quite a few. This, no. is, all right. this on, is the story of my life here. Because I have seen those on non, non-Apple mm-hmm. uh, earphones for sure. Yeah, I just noticed uh, the pair that I'm wearing has, has a set, although I have them in the wrong ear. So. Um, it's non-Apple. Yeah. Apple, no, Apple doesn't do that. Apple is it on the plastic? I mean, the little make it easy rubber there? No. no. There is no, there's nothing that I can physically Apple feel. assumes that their customers know left from right. <laughs> they, they assume too much. They just say you're putting it in wrong. <laughs> that's right. There you go. All right, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thank you for submitting your stories at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. A great place to go to uh, see what other folks in the audience want us to cover. And we look at it every day to help determine what we cover. Go there, submit stories, vote stories up and down. And thank you, Ina Freed, for joining us again. Let folks know about what you're doing over there at All Things D and where they can find your work online. Well, you know, there's a lot of Windows 8 news coming. Answers to uh, the questions asked today and more coming shortly. Check it out, allthingsd.com. And that's it for us. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv. Give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. Let us know what's on your mind. Keep it short. We might even play it on the show. That number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Scott Johnson joins us tomorrow. See you then.